subscribers and dear online family to this live today. Today we have a special guest in our live today who is a great man in the Catholic Church, a missionary priest serving somewhere in the world. And we want to have a moment of sharing with him so that he could tell us some few tips and some few things that he's experiencing as a Catholic priest. And now I want to welcome him to introduce himself so that we can know who is our guest in today's live. Welcome. Hello, viewers. Uh, this is uh, Father Osino Chien, a Catholic missionary priest, originally from Homa Bay Diocese, which is found in Kenya, but currently on a missionary appointment in Pakistan, a diocese called Islamabad Rawalpindi, a parish called St. Peter and Paul Parish, Chak 79, Sargoda. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Father Austin, for joining and for being part of this live. And uh, everyone else will be curious to know why a young man would wish to surrender everything, to serve the Lord as uh, a single man, and furthermore to serve the Lord in a foreign land. So I would wish to ask you, Father Austin, what inspired you to be a priest, first of all? Personal, my personal uh, initiative and also... When I grew up, I grew in a very good Catholic background family, and uh, I was always inspired by the early missionaries, the white missionaries who evangelized our diocese. And also, as I, a young man, I was an altar server. So I grew up loving the church and seeing what the priests will do, what the religious uh, sisters will do, so once I was also inspired that I should also join this group of priests so that I also serve the Lord at the altar. So that was my big inspiration from the priests whom I encountered. Thank you. And then someone would also ask, because there are two types of service as a priest. You can serve as either a missionary or you can serve as a diocesan priest, but you chose to serve as a missionary priest. What made you choose to serve as a missionary priest? Is it that in yes, your area my... you could not serve as a priest in your local place and just serve the people at home? Why did you choose to serve as a missionary? Yeah, I opted to work as a missionary priest because I was always inspired by the missionaries whom I also encountered. These are people who left their homes, who left their comfort zones to move out to different places so that they could also serve out of their own homes. So I was also inspired that just like these people, I should also go out and serve, especially those who are in the least means of grace, those who maybe have not encountered God or who are in difficulties. So that is why I opted to serve as a missionary priest. Well, I think that is so inspiring. That is nice. And then maybe you briefly describe for us your missionary journey or your priesthood journey, how it began and the steps that you followed, the steps that you jumped until the time when you ordained a priest. Describe in, in, in brief your journey to the priesthood. Yes, my journey to the priesthood, uh, I began in uh, the year 2000 and. Uh, and slowly, slowly getting in touch with the, the different vocation directors. And I was also inspired by one of my colleagues who also happens to be a priest now, also serving as a military missionary priest, who helped me, who inspired me. So when I finished my secondary education, after having been in contact with the vocation director, I applied and joined, and I was admitted to the initial formation there in Luanda, that is in Kakamega Diocese, which is found in Western Kenya, for one year. And then I moved for philosophy in Uganda, that is in a place called Jinja, for my philosophy for two years. And then in 2016, I left uh, after having completed my 
studies there. I was sent for two years mission experience, and I was sent to West Africa in Cameroon in a diocese called the Archdiocese of Amenda. So there I was for two good years. After finishing, I came back to Nairobi, Kenya for my theology at Tangaza University College, where I studied there for four consecutive years while doing theology. After completing in 2022, on July 8th, I was ordained a Catholic priest in my home diocese in Homa Bay. And then uh, in November, late November 2022, I reported for my missionary assignment here in Pakistan. Wow, that is a nice story and that is a nice journey of, of formation. But I would, I would like to ask you, what are some of the things that you enjoyed being in your journey of formation? Like before you became the steps in those, those years, what are some of the things that you really enjoyed during your formation journey? And then the next thing will be that, what were some of the challenges that you encountered during this journey of formation? Yes, one of the things I really enjoyed during my formation journey, uh, being in the seminary and also getting to interact with uh, quite a number of people out of my own culture, out of my own country, getting in touch with different people, getting to know much about their culture, about their language, different kinds of food, and also seeing how people express themselves, their faith in different ways in the different countries that I went. So that was one of the things that uh, I can say was an inspiring factor to me during that time. And coming to the, some of the challenges that I can explain, the first one of them, is now as a missionary, every place you go, you find something new. And one of the things which you find new is a language. Having settling in a place, you have to learn the language of the people so that you really interact with them in a very good way. So I say it's a challenge, yes, but uh, one of the things that as missionaries we have to learn is the language. So it is a challenge, but uh, all in all, I say it is a good challenge that it makes us also to be in touch with the people, to get to know their language, to get to interact with them. And as much as you may not be well or perfect in the language, but the people appreciate that you can, someone has left his home to come to be with them and is doing his best to learn their language. So that is something which I say it's a good challenge for me. Yes. All right, thank you so much. And my next question would be, or my next inquiry would be that, what are some of your responsibilities as a priest that make it, makes it unique, your responsibilities as a priest in the Catholic Church? Yes, one of the responsibilities at this time, other than administering the sacraments, the different sacraments, one of my points is that meeting the people, especially the young people, sharing with them, you no, know, really how to support them, because uh, if we don't train them as early as uh, now, if we don't train them as early as now, then their faith will be very weak. So one of the things is to reach out to them, especially uh, outside the celebration of the sacraments, to reach out to them, to encourage them, to have some good time with them, so that they also get to know their faith and in that, that time they also come to interact with me asking different questions why did you leave your country what are some of the things that really inspire you as a priest to come and serve us in this part of the world so those are some of the things that really inspire me as i reach out to them visiting the sick sometimes administering sacraments reaching out to those who are sick in the hospitals and also visiting on visitations so those are some of the things I do other than the part of celebration of the sacraments. All right. That is nice to hear some of the responsibilities that you undertake as a priest in the Catholic Church. And I would wish to ask you that, do you feel like priesthood is still relevant in this contemporary society? Yes, at the moment, if I take the case of uh, the place where I serve, that is a, a 
or if I take Pakistan as a whole, the country is predominantly Muslim. Around 96% of the total population is Muslim. And uh, the whole population, the Catholics are around 2.3%. And one of the things that really inspire me is to see how people, as much as the Catholics or the Christians, are few in number, if you check the general population, but the way they respond to faith is quite encouraging. And so there are some parts of the country that really, you feel they still need to be evangelized. That primary evangelization is still necessary. So I will also wonder, how will it be without the local priests or the diocesan priests or the missionary priests who are serving in this part of the world? So it's still something relevant because when you look at the country, the population is big, yes, but you'll find if you tell someone that in Pakistan we only have seven dioceses, they wonder because some of us are used to huge dioceses with very many bishops, but here it's the opposite. But as much as they are few in number, they respond well to faith. And there is still much that is still needs to be done. So I feel it's still relevant to our priest at this time. So thank you so much. As we continue interviewing Father Austin, I would wish to tell you that he's one of our priests serving away, serving in Pakistan. And he has a YouTube channel that he uses to evangelize. And you, as we continue, you can continue following him, subscribing to his channel and sharing the link with others because it has a lot of things that you'll be able to learn and you'll be able to know some of the things happening in a country like Pakistan where Christianity or Catholicism is one of the minority. So follow him on his YouTube channel and you'll always, you will always be able to experience the uniqueness of the Catholic liturgy in the other lands. Catholic is one and we belong to this great family. So when you follow him, you'll be able to enjoy the variety of the celebrations that they are having over that side. And I come back to you, Father Austin, with the next question asking you that, how do you balance the demands of the priesthood and your personal demands? How do you balance? Yes, so uh, one of the ways in which I, uh, I balance them, because, uh, you'll find there is uh, sometimes there are some of the things which are like routine you have a specific time if it is time for mass like especially if you take the weekly routine mass at a specific times of the day be it's in the morning hours or in the evening hours but also after having encountered or after having visited the people after having had time with them in the celebration of the sacraments, I come back to the house, have my free time also to relax and also to bring back the different encounters of the pastoral ministry. I come and ask myself, as I reflect, the people whom I encountered, how did that one also speak to me as a person who went to serve them? And as I balance with my own life, it also makes me sometimes to reflect and look back upon my life and also the place where I come from back in Kenya. So I also have to balance between, because if I don't have time to relax, then I will not serve the people well. If I go to serve them when I'm tired, my service delivery will not be very efficient to them. So I have to get time out of the busy schedule to also have time relax, to have time for myself, to have time with the friends, to have time with the Christians around by visiting them and all by also them coming to visit me. So that's how I strike the balance between the two. All right, thank you so much for that. Then the next question would be a very simple one. What are the best moments in your priesthood? The best moments? The best moments for me one of the best moments is uh, when I go to celebrate mass. People from different places, especially some of our mission stations, or if you call them the centers, some they have big number, 
the Christian population. Some are also few. There are some of our centers where you find the only two families, maybe the old church, there are only 10 people. But what gives me joy is that you see how they respond in faith. So for me, when I go to celebrate Mass, I really find it a very good time for myself and also for the Christians whom I encounter. And also here, people really, they always want blessings each and every time. As much as Mass is the highest form of prayer for us as Catholics, but after Mass, you still find people coming to you. Oh, yeah, they use the word Father G. Father G, bless me. Father G, bless me. Father G, pray for me. So those are the best moments that I really find it here, while here in Pakistan, as I serve the people. Being together with the Christians, serving them, reaching out to them, offering a cup of tea for me when I go to visit them. Those are some of the best moments, and I really cherish them as I serve them in this part of the world. So in, when you were talking, I heard you mention something like Father G. So what is, what is Father G? Is it your nickname yes, that side, a, or what is it? It's a, like a respectable title, like uh, if you are a priest, they will call you Father G. If you are a brother, they will call you Brother G. If you are a, a bishop, they will call you Bishop G. So it just the word G is added so that it becomes like an honor, a sign of respect to the person whom, whom you are addressing. So it's a very honorable title. So they have to add that word. Someone will not uh, call you just uh, father or brother or sister. They will add that word G so that uh, it really means that the person really respects you and really honors you in the society. Thank you so much and thanks for our audience. I see some people really enjoying what we are saying. Clement Kitoli is down there saying that it is nice being a Catholic priest. Phyllis Kariuki is saying, may God bless you for the good work that you are doing over there. And Morris is saying that is so inspirational of you. And I would wish to ask you now, like you are in Pakistan, do you miss home? Yes, uh, they always say east or west, home is the best. But uh, as much as I miss home, I always uh, get in touch with the people back home. Nowadays, things, uh, the world has become a global village, as they always put it. So getting in touch with them through different social platforms, it makes me really not miss home that much. And I can also say that Pakistan has also become my home. Sometimes the Christians, they call me in their family, in their various homes. I go to visit them and they tell me, feel at home. This is also your home. This is a part of your family. So it makes me feel that I'm still within my home country because I find people who really have accepted me and also ready to welcome me. So I really feel much honored by the people here in Pakistan. Given a chance to choose if you are to go back to serve in Pakistan or you are to come back to serve in your home country, what would be your option? Yeah, it's a very nice question and a very interesting one, but uh, I can say this is my second year running now, working here in Pakistan. Just began my second year now, this is a few months uh, ago. And uh, I can say it's still hardly to judge or to decide whether to come back and work home. Sometimes we'll always want to work where you know the people, you're familiar with the culture, you don't have to learn the language, you are familiar with the food and uh, maybe many friends. But I can say here in Pakistan, it's also nice to be here. So at the moment, I will really not uh, say that I will really wish to go back home because I'm still settling here. I'm still in the process also of uh, learning the language, getting deeper and to know the culture of the people. So at the moment, I will say, I would still love to stay here so that I also in, encounter and experience this part of the world. So what are, what are, what are some of the unique things in, in, in Pakistan in regards to the liturgy, mass, some things which are unique, uh, comparing it to Kenya, because you are from Kenya, now you are celebrating the liturgy in Pakistan. Are there some things which are the same? Are there some things that are different? Is there something unique? 
It's one of the things if you compare part of the liturgy, you see like uh, in Africa generally during mass people dance like uh, you'll find these uh, children or the PMC or you can call them Sunday school children dancing throughout the mass at different times of the mass. So here it is not there here in Pakistan, it is not there. Once in a while the children can come if they have to perform some little skit, maybe after mass or after post-communion prayer, if it is like a day for the children or even day for the women, the children can come along maybe before the altar, they sing a song in honor of the women, they sing a song maybe if it is their Independence Day. So that is one of the things uh, that I find, uh, I can say that I really miss uh, that part of dancing, the jovial mood of the church in terms of dancing. And also another thing which you I find unique here, you know, uh, most of our churches back home, if not all, if I said all of our churches there in Kenya, there are pews where people sit, but here, because of their culture, you'll find a uh, few churches maybe that were built by early missionaries. They're the ones with pews, or if you can, in layman's language, you can call them the benches where people sit in the church. But uh, here, people sit on the carpet. So you'll find on one side of the, maybe on the farthest right is uh, maybe the men and and on the left uh, there is a there are the men so the men and the women they sit on the either ends they don't mix in the church uh, so you'll only find uh, maybe at the sanctuary that's where there's a presider's chair and maybe for the altar service that's the only place where there are chairs or other places you may find there are some few chairs because there are some of the Christians who have some complications. They cannot sit on the carpet, maybe because of their their sick or they're advanced in age. So that's where you can find some few small chairs put uh, uh, along the wall so that whoever is in need of them can sit. Otherwise, everybody sits on the floor. So that is one of the things which is very unique here. Those are some of the things which are unique here. And then another one is that uh, sometimes uh, uh, there is influence of the also the other denomination, Christian denominations, like you find uh, as a priest, if you don't reach out to the Christians on a very re regular basis, then you'll find they have gone to maybe a different church. You may find uh, because in our places you find the priest only go, maybe can go to a particular outstation or a sub-parish maybe once in a month. But here we ensure that we reach out to them every single Sunday. Because the more you stay away from them, you'll find the pastor has grabbed them. So they only bring their children for sacraments in the church so that because the government may ask for official documents, but in real sense you find them they pray in a different church so that is one of the things we have to reach out to them on a very regular basis otherwise they will, they will go like that so those are some of the unique things i find in the celebration of the of the liturgy here so far. all right thank you so much and then would you tell us something about the other religions in pakistan yes yeah as i said uh, Earlier on, uh, the country is uh, predominantly Muslim. All total, around 96% of the whole population is Muslim. So the different religions, uh, it Hindus, Hindus or Hinduism, as you may call it, uh, Christianity, they share the remaining uh, percentage. Because you also have the Church of Pakistan, you have different uh, churches but uh, the predominant one is a Muslim. So you find most of the things, the, in a way, I can say even the way we s operate in the church, like uh, the men sit on one side, the women on the other side, according to my, or in my own perspective, is that uh, some of these things are borrowed from the Muslim culture or the Islam, because some of these things, once you grow up, these are the predominant ones then, 
as much as you don't practice the same faith, you may find yourself also borrowing some of these things from them, which is not bad, yes, so long as we do something the church call inculturation. Some of the things in our own cultures, we blend them together in liturgy so that uh, some aspects of our liturgy becomes very much in line with the culture of the people. So that is one of the things which I can say. So the country is predominantly Muslim, but the Christians, uh, they also do their part, as I say. That's why I said it's not uh, the priest or a priest is still relevant in this part of the world or in this point in time. So that some of these areas where they still need evangelization, where the Christians, they are still not like many in number. If you put in terms of numbers, they have someone or they have a, a group or maybe a priest to reach out to them in their different localities where they stay, where they stay. So I really feel that uh, the Christians, they are minority, yes, but they play their part. Uh, through the leadership of the, in, in the church, the bishop, the conference of bishops, the priest, uh, the diocesan priest, and also the missionary priests who are around, we do our best to ensure that we give the best to our Christians. All right, thank you so much. And it is interesting to listen that Christianity is one of the minority religions in that place. I would wish just to know, is there any means of collaboration between the Christians and the other religions, especially Muslim, between the Catholics? How, how is your collaboration with them? Yes, normally, oftentimes the conference of bishops, uh, they organize uh, they call it interreligious harmony, where the bishop or the, the conference of bishops, or sometimes they organize, each bishop organizes in his own diocese, or sometimes uh, the other faiths, they come together so that they promote that unity among themselves, so that they also come to know each other, so that each and every person respects the faith of the other. So oftentimes when we are in our diocese, is the Islamabad Rawalpini Diocese, the Archbishop uh, Dr. Joseph Arshad normally organizes that, uh, either it can happen uh, in the cathedral or at his residence, or sometimes those other faiths, they call them. So they meet in different places so that they promote that oneness as, uh, as much as uh, we have different beliefs, but at least we are people, one nation, we are people from, like, uh, each of us, have, we have our own beliefs, but that one should not make us fight, should not make us, like, be at loggerheads with one another. So that is one of the things which really I can appreciate our various bishops in our various dioceses, uh, or in general, the Conference of Catholic Bishops here in Pakistan, that they are doing their best to ensure that that interfaith harmony is realized. Thank you so much. I also see some of our online viewers joining and they are happy with whatever is going on. Jennifer Mwikali is down there saying that may the good Lord enrich you in your ministry. Thank you. Thank you. And today also we know that we are celebrating the Muslim days of Eid. We also wish them well in their celebrations and we hope that our collaboration with them may continue and we may continue collaborating to making a world a better place where everyone feels happy to belong. Then the next question is that, I know like a priest, there are so many people criticize priests. There are so many people criticize pastors. How do you handle criticism? Yeah, sometimes uh, I say <clears throat> people can uh, criticize especially if something happens. They always, one thing we have to also understand is that also a priest is a human being. And we also, we have our own challenges, we have our own limitations. At times the criticism come when maybe a priest has done something, let me say wrong, then people come to say that, okay, priests or priests are like this because one person has done, they say, they always say that uh, uh, only if you have like uh, one rotten fruit and you mix them with the rest, it will spoil everything. 
So like if you find maybe one has done something or one uh, is in the news or is in the headlines because of one or reason or the other, then people tend to brand priesthood in a, a given way. So at times people may ask, but the best thing I will always offer or ask them is always to also pray for them. Because as much as uh, we are also human beings, they too are human beings. We also, we also mess or we also do wrong. But it's a time not really to throw stones at us or point fingers at us, but the time also to correct us, to pray for us. So times is really not a time to say, okay, this person has done this, so all the priests are like this. No. So it's a time that you sit back, know what, what really is transpired or why is it that uh, this so-and-so is being criticized or why is it that uh, priests are being criticized in general. So we take it case by case and see what really best as a priest can I do so that this one doesn't happen again or what can I do as a priest to ensure that uh, this kind of criticism are not there. One of the things is really to maybe to explain to the people, sometimes those who may ask, if I have some kind of knowledge, I can share it out to them to really explain to them some of these things. Then, thank you so much for that. Just to remind you that to, with us on this live today is Father Austin, a male missionary priest serving in Pakistan, and he's been able to share with us some of the experiences that he has got since he began his missionary journey and since he was ordained and is currently serving in Pakistan, a country that is predominantly Muslim. Father Austin always shares with us a lot of experiences from Pakistan in his YouTube channel called Father Austin Official. So, all the viewers who will be privileged to view this interview, make it an initiative to follow Father Austin, to enjoy more of the experiences, and to enjoy more of viewing how Christianity is flourishing in Pakistan. And the, I would also ask you, in Africa, we find that so many people are still joining seminaries. Seminaries are full. Many people, there's a lot of vocations. How is it in that place? Are there people who are, who are, who are discerning or who are aspiring to become priests in that area? Yes, uh, as you have said, uh, vocation is flourishing in Africa in general. But uh, over here, the number of guys or the seminarians in the minor or major seminaries, it is not that much. Some of the dioceses you'll find most of them are missionary priests. If I mention one of our dioceses here in the country, over 50% or 60%, if I'm not wrong, most of them are missionary priests. It's a very pastoral <coughs> diocese. So you'll find most of the guys there, or most of the priests serving there, are missionary priests. And even here in the diocese of Islamabad, or Pindi, where I serve, there are quite a number of guys in the seminary, but you'll find uh, Remember a few days ago, I was speaking to the, uh, I happened to have met the Archbishop, and he was sharing with me that here yeah, the number of vocations to priesthood are not that many compared to Africa because he was once a diplomat in Africa, he was in the diplomacy, he was there in uh, a diplomat in Madagascar. So he saw how Africa was flourishing in vocations, how it was a jovial community. So coming to compare here, it's really like uh, the missionaries have really played a, a good role in ensuring or in building the faith of the people. Because especially in this diocese, if I can put it, it was, it was started by the male missionaries. The first two bishops were male missionaries. So you'll really find that at this moment, the, the Assyrian priests, the clergy, they are coming up most parishes in the diocese are run by the diocesan clergy. So they are coming up, but the vocation is still something that we have to promote. We have to inspire young men to join the seminaries. We also have to inspire 
the young girls or the ladies so that they also join the religious life so that we too can continue to promote and build the church. All right, thank you so much. What would you advise a young man desiring to become a priest or a sister? One, one of the things that I'll, I feel like if I take the case here in Pakistan, uh, asking uh, the different people, those who have joined, maybe they are in the minor seminary, those who are in the major seminaries, or those who have joined different religious houses or religious congregations. Sometimes I also do ask them what really inspired them. But the same answer sometimes some of them give me that uh, they were inspired by some of our male missionaries, especially in this diocese, who worked. Like in the parish where I am, there is a, a male missionary who has been in Pakistan for 56 years working in the same diocese. So these are some of the figures you, you are born, you find is already serving among the people. You grow up, to be, you finish your studies in uh, primary or secondary school. The same, same person is still there in your diocese serving. So some of these, they see their selfless service, how they offer themselves to the people, serving the people, leaving their comfort zones to come and serve the people. So when you I interact with some of these young men who are maybe in the seminary or who want to join the seminary, these are some of the encounters which they really share with me. But even to the young girls, those as much as the culture is male dominated, but when you have a chance to speak to them or when you have a chance to interact with them, they also still mention, sometimes some don't even mention some religious nuns who have inspired them, but you still hear some say, I was inspired by Father so and so, and later on I was told I cannot be a priest, I can only be a religious sister. So. That is some of, one of the things which really still inspire the presence of the missionaries in some of our mission areas that still inspires vocation up to this present moment. And we too, in our different parishes, we still continue to promote vocation. We still encourage the young men and women to still join either the seminary or go to the religious congregations to be religious nuns. Thank you so much. Someone was asked, someone was once asking me that, how much do priests earn? So do you earn some salary at the end of the month? And then someone was saying that we see missionaries doing great work in the parishes. So where do they get their funds? Yes, uh, that is a question that <laughs> most people always ask. Uh, like uh, the CEO, priests, uh, some always have this thing of priests, they eat well, priests, they drive big cars, or priests, they stay in nice houses. One of the things I can say is that this is a vocation. It's different from uh, if someone uh, maybe is in another kind of life, maybe is employed, you have to earn a salary at the end of the month, or you have to get some wage at the end of the day or at the end of the week. But this one sometimes is not the case because this is a vocation, it is a call. And when someone asks that, where do you get the money from? How do you live such kind of life? Sometimes I can be in the house, in the parish house, out of nowhere, a Christian comes. Father G, I've invited you for lunch, oh, Father G, here is some food for you. Maybe they brought chicken, they brought uh, fish, they brought uh, vegetables or rice, which is common here. So at the end of the day, you have something to eat. And they also know that you have to support the priests by giving the little they have. So the little they, they chip in, 
That is what we use to survive. And also through getting donations from different people, those well-wishers who really want to support us in mission. So that is how we get to, or we get our daily bread. So it is not really that uh, at the end of the month, I wait for my salary to get something to put in my pocket, no. It just sometimes from the well-wishers or from the Christians, they feel, Father should, it is Easter, Father should buy a new shirt. Father sh should have a new pair of trousers. So at the end of the day, you find someone has brought for you a material, Father, Father G. Here is a material, you can make some summer cloth, Father G. Yeah, is uh, maybe it is too hot to, for you to put on a pair of shoes, a close pair of shoes. Yeah, some money, buy a pair of sandals or open shoes for that matter, which fits you. So that is how slowly by slowly the Christians support us and we also support them in different ways. Thank you so much, Father Austin. For those joining our, jo our live today, we are hosting Father Austin, a million missionary priest working in Pakistan, who is here to share with us his experience as being a missionary serving in a foreign land. He is a Kenyan by birth, but jo enjoys his loving service in Pakistan. If you would wish to know more about Father Austin, follow him on YouTube. He's called Father Austin Official. You'll always find him and you'll enjoy whatever I will be giving you through the evangelization of social media platforms. So Father Austin, how many priests do you stay in that parish? And how is it working in that community as uh, with the other priests that you stay with? Yes, at the moment uh, we are too. I'm a uh, missionary priest, as uh, I'd introduced myself, uh, working alongside the uh, the Assyrian priest who is uh, who happens to be the parish priest and also one of the seminarians, uh, the Assyrian seminarians who is on pastoral work. So we share our different responsibilities if it comes to the sacraments or maybe home visitations and uh, playing different roles to ensure that the life the Christians so to ensure that we serve the Christians in a better way. So that is how we are here at the moment. We are mixed in a way that uh, I'm the only missionary, I'm a military missionary priest and also serving alongside uh, the Assyrian priest. So that is how we, we stay here at the moment. So in Kenya we have various meals like kuku, chapati, omena, and fish and etc. So do you find these meals there? Or it, when it is there, it is something different? I have to swear that uh, <laughs> I really miss the Kenyan delicacies, uh, especially ugali, fish, which is uh, much common, all common in uh, my home area, the Omena. So here, yeah, basically, find uh, they have this, we call it uh, maybe roti or there, we, we call it chapati. So it is a, it's almost like uh, eating ugali there back in Kenya every day. Which sometimes if you, in Kenya, if someone doesn't uh, eat ugali, may say that he or she has not eaten something. So yeah, it is fine, mostly it is that roti which people eat. They cook it in different ways. Uh, sometimes in the morning, they cook it at home, they don't cook it at home. They call it prata for breakfast. And then at lunch, now they make it dry one without uh, maybe oil. So they call it roti. And then uh, maybe evening again, they may eat it with some kind of uh, maybe green grams or some kind of vegetables. So that is how life is here. And uh, 
the foods are very spicy so if you're not a man of spices then or if you're longing to visit Pakistan either in the near future then at least start training slowly by slowly how to put some bit of spices spicy or put some bit of spices in your food so that by the time you land here then you will not have problems with otherwise uh, another common one is uh, rice rice is also common and grow it in large scale here i think uh, rice uh, if you go to some of our big supermarkets there back in kenya or in east africa you'll find uh, pakistani rice is sold almost everywhere so it is also common meal here thank you thank you so much for that I, I can feel like I, I can feel what you are feeling when you say you miss the Kenyan delicacy. And I can see it in a, your expression as you talk. But I hope you are enjoying whatever is provided there. I find it in Kenya that sometimes after months you'd find Christians welcoming you for a meal. Is it is it the same practice there or after you have celebrated mass with the people, you go home to eat in the parish? Is it something like are they hospitable enough to welcome you maybe after mass to have some time with them, some stories, some meals? Something like that. Yes, yeah. One of the things is, uh, especially, I believe is because of also the the weather that you find tea has become part of them. That you may be just moving around, maybe you're going to buy something in the shop and. Uh, one of the Christians happened to meet you on the way or you pass next to his or her house, one of the things they will tell you, oh, Father G, welcome for a, a cup of chai. So one thing I can say, they are hospitable enough. Sometimes, uh, like normally on Sundays, when you go for Mass, after Mass, you go to maybe a family, you have some breakfast before you move to the next Mass. Because uh, they also feel uh, you have really done your best here and you may be tired or you need some kind of energy to proceed to the next place so they'll offer you a cup of tea. Or sometimes even the course of the day, they may just call you and ask you whether you are in, uh, would you mind coming for a cup of chai? So I say they are very hospitable here enough. So how many masses do you celebrate in a Sunday? Yes, uh, that is a very <laughs> good question. And uh, <clears throat> normally when I tell people about this, uh, about the number of masses I celebrate on a Sunday, they think uh, I'm a fanatic or uh, some of them, they ask me whether is it the Catholic Church because they want to quote the canon law says you uh, should celebrate this number of masses. So basically on a Sunday, I have at least uh, six masses on a Sunday, at least six. Because uh, as I said, the Christians, if you don't reach out to them, because we have uh, almost 32 churches, let me not call them, I don't call them sub-parishes, but they are churches because some we pray in people's homes. There is no that physical structure which you call a church. As we know, church is not basically the structure. But uh, if I put it in the form of a structure, you'll find uh, some of the places we don't have that physical structure. So we pay. Maybe one of the Christian offers him or herself offers his home for prayer. So we find ourselves because they, we may be in, many in number. We pray in the corridor. So they offer their house for that. So sometimes the next door, we find there is a church. The pastor is there. So if you don't reach out to this uh, community, the next time you come, you'll find they have already gone to the, the boss, they have already gone to the other denomination. The pastor has already taken them and gone with them. So we really have to do our best. And then one of the things as uh, like. Uh, as we, we go out for those number of masses so that we keep them going so that they get used to that aspect of prayer each and every time because if we don't reach out to them as i say they will go and one interesting fact is that uh, which i feel uh, even in kenya I've never encountered it 
We have one of our, some of our churches where you find uh, it is one church, but different denominations use it at the different times. You find uh, the, maybe the UP church, they use, they go for prayers in that same church, maybe at six in the morning. Another, maybe Pentecostal, they come in the same, same church around midday. And then we go there for mass in the evening around five o'clock. So it is one church, but it serves three different groups, if I may put it. So you find some of the things like uh, we may not put uh, the statues there because uh, we have to be mindful of the other people who may not really appreciate that. So you find it is something very interesting here, like that one it shows you some signs of unity among the Christian denominations themselves. So we just have to agree which time suits us. Okay, the pastor will come in the morning, another one will come at midday, the priest will come in the evening. So that's how we organize those of our celebrations. So we find ourselves uh, like sometimes we have to respond to the needs so uh, on the ground. So that's why we have those number of masses which as I say, some will say, oh, you are a fanatic, you're just doing it for fun, but it's not really for fun, it's just because of the needs on the ground. Mm, that is quite interesting. Then the last thing that I would ask for today is that you say mass in which language? And how did, you, how, how did it take you to learn the language, if, if so, if it is different language? Yes, yeah. We say mass in Urdu language. So, like as missionaries, as I put it first in the beginning, we have to learn the language of the people. Because here, yeah, very few parishes, maybe one or two, you'll find they have mass in English on a Sunday. You'll find it at the cathedral, and also one of the parishes within the city, in the, it is the capital city in Islamabad, where we have maybe different people who are from in, serving in the embassies, different diplomats. So those are the only parishes I know in the old diocese where they have masses in English. So as I say, as missionaries, when you arrive in a place, in a foreign land, one of the first thing is to learn the language of the people. So at the onset when I came out to learn the language, at the same time get used to maybe to celebrate mass also in Urdu, and also with time preach in the same, same language. So I don't claim that I'm perfect in it, but I see progress slowly by slowly each and every day. So that is what keeps me moving. I keep learning from the people uh, and as I prepare my homilies, there are some of the words that uh, appear frequently, so I get to know that I use them as my vocabularies, and they help me to build my language. Reading of Urdu also, it helps me also to get familiarized with other words and also to speak. So basically in the old, in the old diocese or in our parish, we use Urdu as a mode of communication and also far as liturgy is concerned. Would you say God is good in that language? Uh, when uh, God, like, uh, one of the things uh, before I respond to that is that uh, sometimes uh, when people ask you, they rec because of the influence of the, say, Islam or Muslim, then uh, there's this word Allah, it becomes very, it becomes very common, like, uh, so instead of someone tells you, uh, like, do have a good, like, God bless, you'll hear someone saying, maybe Allah Barkade, like, God to bless you. So instead of using the word uh, God, the person will, uh, we use the word Allah because you'll find uh, in the schools they are, the religious uh, is not like in Kenya where 
like you'll find these ones they go for maybe religious education you'll find these ones goes for islamic religious these ones go for christian but since you are in the most as i say 96 percent is uh, muslim then you'll find uh, the religion like in schools you have to do the in kenya we may call it the islamic re, re, religious education so you'll find uh, these are some of the things uh, even if you get some of the translations you'll find uh, uh, which maybe they're transliterated instead of putting maybe they're translated by christians but instead of putting huda which means uh, god you'll find it is written allah so it's just one of the things that really makes you know that uh, the the... All right, thank you so much, Father Austin, for that. I know that is it is so interesting listening to partial stories from that place. And uh, I think so many people who are watching this video will be inspired to know more about mission in Pakistan specifically. Uh, I, would, I, I would like to ask you, if you give an opportunity to be a young boy, would you still wish to become a priest or you would opt for something else? Yes, for me, so far, I have no regrets and uh, I still appreciate this my initiative or my call or whatever I chose to do. And uh, I still, I'm still convinced that even if given a second chance, this will still be my first option because I really love what I'm doing. I really love being in this part of the world, serving the people. So I still believe, I'm still convinced that even given second or third chance, I will still appreciate doing what I, I am doing, what I'm doing at the moment, that is serving as a priest. Then you, it, is, it, is, it is nice to hear that you belong to the Melil missionaries. Would you tell us something about Melil missionaries, what they do, Something about Melil missionaries that you belong to, so that at least those who are viewing will also know that Father Austin belongs to the Melil missionaries. Who are these Melil missionaries? What do they do? Where do they serve? What, something of the sort. Yes, the Melil missionaries uh, founded by late Cardinal Abbot Vaughan in 1866. And we serve uh, in uh, different missions. At the moment, our headquarters is in the UK, and we serve in different missions. Our motto being to love and to serve. And we serve in different missions, especially in areas which they still need primary evangelization, those who are in the least means of grace. Like if I take example of Asia as a continent, we serve in Pakistan, where I am, and in Pakistan, as I said, we are in, found in two dioceses, the Diocese of Islamabad, Rawalpindi, where I am, and the Diocese of Hyderabad, where some of our missionaries from Africa and from uh, Asia also are. And also we are in Malaysia, we are in uh, Philippines, and also Cambodia, and also in India. And in Africa, we are in uh, Kenya, Uganda, we are in DR Congo. We serve in South Sudan, Cameroon, South Africa. And also, we have missions in, the, in Europe. Although now you'll find uh, most of uh, the people serving are either from Africa or from Asia because uh, those from Europe, they are, most of them have passed on or are advanced in age and cannot be involved in active ministry. So those who are interested or those who are willing to join or those who have sons who love to join Millil missionaries in these specific countries, just get to in touch with us so that uh, maybe your son or your daughter or your relative or whoever is following us will want to join can uh, continue or can start journeying through the help of the vocation director 
so that uh, he gets in touch with the concern so that he continues to build or to get more inspired before he officially be admitted to Milil missionaries. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. So what makes it unique being a Milil missionary and not being any other, other missionary? What makes it unique? As I say, what makes it unique is, uh, I feel one of the things is really the people whom we serve. Because uh, most of our missions are not in those uh, fancy, fancy areas. Most of our missions are maybe in the village setup, or they're not really in urban apostolate. We don't really do much urban apostolate. So it's really nice to be in touch with the people, maybe if it is in the village or if it is in a place. It could be in the city, but it's in the slums. These people who sometimes we say they're least in the need, means of grace. So it makes it unique. I may not really compare with other missionary congregations or others, but I say being with that such kind of group, being identified with such kind of group, those maybe who are considered low in the society, it's really a blessing so that as you serve them, you also feel the joy, right? Like you are really in a, a nice place. Those who feel maybe they are rejected in the society, look at the example of Jesus Christ, those whom people never wanted to associate with, those are the people whom he went to. Those are the people who people are viewed as sinners. Those are the ones whom he associated himself with. So we to associate ourselves with these people who are maybe least in the means of grace, far from the means of grace, to ensure that we bring to them that joy of the gospel. Thank you so much. It means in summary to love and to serve those in greatest need. I see so many people following us currently, and I see Helen, who says that may Almighty God keep you safe and continue guiding you as you continue serving God and His people? Helen is saying he's happy and is watching live from Uganda, his homeland. So thank you so much, Father Austin, for being part of, of, of this channel. And would you like to tell us something about your channel, your YouTube channel, what you do there? Yeah, something small so that those who are watching may also follow you and learn to know more about your mission in Pakistan as a missionary. Yes, thank you very much. As you introduced, uh, my channel is uh, the name of the channel, YouTube channel, is for the Austin official. I began it uh, to help answer some of the questions that many people asked me because they wondered why I came to Pakistan. They asked, are there Christians really in Pakistan? What is really your mission there in Pakistan? Do Christians even exist in Pakistan? And if they do exist, what kind of activities are you involved in? What kind of mission are you involved in? And how is the setup of the maybe their worship? Do they follow like the maybe the Hindu system or the how the Muslims pray or worship? So this is what inspired me to start this channel. And through the different uh, clips that I have posted there over time, through the comments I get from the people, I respond to them or ever maybe through the ch YouTube channel or through WhatsApp if I happen to have their number, I reach out to them and help them answer some of these questions. And also this will also help our future missionaries, meet of different congregations, or even whoever will want to know more about Pakistan. You know that you are coming to Pakistan, this is how the faith is. So you are coming to a place, as much as you are coming maybe for the first time, but you have some knowledge of how the worship is. Because you may go to a place, you are completely new, you go to the internet, you, go, you Google and get some of the information. You find it was posted there a long time ago and things have since changed. But these are the new inspirations 
what we get, especially about the church that continues to encourage us. And as we watch, it is also a time that it also encourages each and every one of us to continue to pray. We pray for you over here in Pakistan, and also as you watch, you continue to pray for us over there, wherever you are following us from, or wherever you are following us from, as far as the channel is concerned. So thank you so much. I can see Maurice is also saying he's watching live from Uganda. Helen is saying he's watching live from Lebanon. So thank you so much for choosing to use social media platform to evangelize. Because in our current society, we find social media has been used for so many things, which may be misleading. But when we find people who come up with options to use the social media platform to inspire, to build, and to unite the world together, it, it, it becomes even more nice and interesting. So thank you so much for the option of, try, of using your social media platform to reach out to the millions of people who are always following social media platforms to get some spiritual nourishment. So thank you so much and continue using this media to evangelize, to reach out to the Lord's flock and to do it. So would you please tell us the real name of your channel and in case you are on YouTube or other media platforms, you could wish to tell us so that we can follow you and get you right there. Yes, on my YouTube channel, the name is Father Austin Official. Same on Instagram, Father Austin Official. And also the same name on TikTok, Father Austin Official. And on Facebook, I use Austin Ochieng. So those are the names I, you'll find me on different social media platforms so that whichever you watch or whichever you follow, we may continue to evangelize. As you watch the videos, as you watch the clips, it's also an opportunity for you to pray for us, not only for me, but also for the church in Pakistan. And through your prayers, I believe, become even much stronger. So we continue to pray for one another. Thank you so much. I see Emmanuel is saying, may God bless you and continue to protect you in your work. So thank you so much, Father Austin, for the time that you have spent with us. I know you have a busy schedule. You have so many masses. I know all some engagements that you really need to go to. So I thank you for the moment and the time that you have been with us in this life today. And we pray that we'll continue interacting so that we continue with this job and this great work of evangelization through social media platforms. Thank you all our subscribers who are joined us and our media and our social media followers we keep you in our prayers we keep you updated and now i'll invite father austin to give us a concluding word then after the concluding word you could pray for us then we shall end this live on my part i bro mikhail thank you so much for joining and know that i love you and you're always in my heart in case you need us to talk on anything that you'd wish us to talk about always feel free to comment on any video any topic any issue that you want us to address and we'll always be there to journey with you walk with you along this journey of faith thank you so much be blessed welcome father austin thank you very much brother mikhail so also thank you for this kind of initiative i believe through our interactive session is also a way that we evangelize get to hear about what is happening now in Africa or Kenya in specific where you are and also get to know what is happening here in Pakistan. Maybe there are those who are getting some information from Pakistan maybe for the first time and those who are coming to build on what they have heard before. And as much as the Christianity is concerned or as much as the Catholic faith is concerned, so it is a very good opportunity and I appreciate and I believe for our viewers in different parts of the globe where they find themselves at this moment. One of the things as you continue to promote us on this huge social media platform, continue to pray for us so that this is one of the way in which we evangelize because you realize at this time some of the people don't even come to church. 
but he or she may be at home listening to these words that we say, listening to this inspiration, and they get to be transformed and something touches them. At least it gives them some hope. So you continue to pray for us. And as Brother Mikaela said, if there is any through following, through subscribing, or through following us in the different social platforms, if there is anything you would like to know as far as Pakistan is concerned, as much as the faith in Pakistan is concerned, do leave a comment. Share it with us so that we get to be in touch, so that we share together. The topic you bring and we share together will also help a brother or a sister who is in a different place, who has doubt, who is also longing to know more about the Christian faith. So thank you very much once again for the opportunity. Thank you once again, our viewers, for following us wherever you are. And may our good Lord continue to bless you. May our good Lord bless your families and all the things that you do for the greater glory of God. Thank you so much. You can lead us in the closing prayer, then it will be good to go. Thank you so much, all the subscribers and the followers. I'm so happy. And Father Austin, from the bottom of my heart, I continue to be happy. Welcome. So I'll uh, conclude the prayer and also a blessing from uh, Pakistan, and we shall have the blessing in Urdu, if you permit me. Please, before you go, someone is asking a question that down on the comment section, Helen is saying that some of us in Arab countries, we don't go to church. So how can we go for confession? Maybe I think you would answer this briefly before you give us the final blessing and prayer. Yes, uh, sometimes uh, there are some of the questions which uh, I love that question very much because uh, uh, it helps us to know how we can really approach some of these sacraments. I give an example during the time of COVID-19. Many of us will not reach where the priests were who were in the seminary, but sometimes there are some of the things we will do online, like uh, one of them will be maybe a spiritual guide. And sometimes, once in a while, even this the sacrament of penance or confessions, because of pastoral needs or of the situation which was at hand, we could not do that. Just as sometimes you may want to receive Holy Communion, but you are very far, but there's that communion of desire. So I think it is possible if you get to in touch with a priest wherever he is, you can just arrange with him. He can listen to your although it's not the best, but there is you really want to confess, but you can't because of the distance, there is no priest around. So that is one of the ways in which you can use that platform. So be whichever priest you know, you can approach him and he can help you in this aspect. So that is how I can respond to you, Helena. Thank you so much for the response. And I know, Helen, you might still be having a lot of inquiries. That is why we say it is right. You could follow Father Austin and you would share with him even more through his social media platforms. He would guide you and he would show you the right way to go. So Father Austin, welcome. So we pray, God our Father, we thank you. For the gift of today, we thank you for all the graces that you've given unto us each and every time of our lives. We thank you for calling us to serve you in different ways. We thank you for the gift of our families, for the gift of the works that you have given unto us. We ask that you continue to increase our faith so that we too may continue to encounter you in our lives as we serve you and as we serve our brothers and sisters. 
Bless us in the different countries where we are. Continue to keep us safe. Bless our works. Bless those all who depend on us. And above all, Lord, we ask you to increase our faith so that we may continue to know you, we may continue to love you, and we may continue to serve you. We thank you for this opportunity that we have had, all that you have shared here. May it be for the greater glory of your name. Bless us so that we too may continue to experience and encounter you, especially this Easter season, so that our faith may continue to increase. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Padre Mutle Kuda, Bab or Better Kudoski Barkat Sapar Nazilho. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye bye. God bless.